from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello, welcome to Free Expression from the opinion page of the Wall Street Journal. I'm Jerry Baker, editor-at-large of the journal. If you're not already subscribing to Free Expression, please do sign up wherever you get your podcasts. This week, Trump's second term. Donald Trump's wasted no time putting together the key members of his team for his second administration that will take office in January. In just over a week since his election victory, we've had a succession of announcements of nominations for cabinet and other positions. And true to Trumpian form, the names so far have contained both some familiar names for conventional policymaking types and a few big surprises. First out of the gate were picks for his foreign policy and domestic security teams. Marco Rubio, the Florida senator, named for Secretary of State. Mike Waltz, congressman from Florida, to be national security advisor. And Elise Stefanik, the New York congresswoman, nominated as ambassador to the United Nations. One surprise on that national security team was Pete Hexeth, the Afghan war veteran, who for the last few years has been a commentator and a host on the Fox News channel, as well as an outspoken advocate for veterans. Trump also announced appointments to key positions to deal with the immigration crisis. Thomas Homan, who served as head of immigration and customs informant in the president's first term, will be the new border czar. And Christine Noam, the South Dakota governor, was nominated as Secretary of Homeland Security. And then came the real surprises. First, Matt Gates, the Florida congressman who led the putsch to oust Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House a year ago and has been the subject of an ethics investigation in the House. He was nominated by Trump to be Attorney General. Then Tulsi Gabbard, the former Democratic congresswoman, nominated to be Director of National Intelligence. Both, it's fair to say, fairly controversial appointments that may face some headwinds in the Senate. But what do all these appointments signify? And what could we expect from Trump's second term overall, especially in this crucial field of national security and foreign policy? Well, joining me to discuss all this is Robert Wilkie. He served as Veterans Affairs Secretary in the first Trump administration. And last week, Trump named him to run the president's transition plan at the Pentagon. And Robert Wilkie joins me now. Secretary Wilkie, thanks for joining Free Expression. Well, thank you for having me. So you were named just recently to organize the transition plans for the Pentagon in particular by President Trump. Let me ask you first of all, so former president has already named his choice for defense secretary, Pete Hegseth, Fox News host, commentator, Afghan veteran, outspoken figure on defense matters, especially on veterans and indeed the Pentagon itself. What's the thinking behind that nomination? Well, I think it's it's an appointment that goes along with President and Trump's own campaign, and that's an appointment to shake up Washington, D.C., and you see that across the spectrum in terms of presidential appointments. Now, we've been working on presidential transition for quite a while now in terms of developing a policy, and it's pretty simple. It's to restore what what I would call the military ethic, the ethic of a, a profession of arms, as opposed to what we see has happened in the Department of Defense in the last four years, where we have leaders, particularly the civilian leaders, some in uniform, who are treating the profession of arms as a jobs program. Uh, Physical fitness standards are shot. The Navy and Air Force continue to shrink. And actually, we're on a trajectory. We would have been on a trajectory had Harris won of hitting 2% of GDP on defense for the first time, I think, since the administration of Calvin Coolidge. Uh, That's the kind of dangerous path we've been on. And President Trump has promised to shake up that scenario. And what does Pete Hegseth bring particularly to that task? Well, I think it brings a lot more energy than you've seen, certainly in the last four years. I do think that the Republican model of governance is very different. You know, having been a cabinet secretary in the first Trump administration, but also in the um, second Bush administration, an assistant secretary under Rumsfeld and Gates. Those are very different models from what you've seen from Obama and Biden, where the cabinet secretaries are essentially functionaries, where the White House staff explodes in size, and it's the 30-something radicals who are running the show. And what, what do I mean by that or as an example of that? I mean, we've had the spectacle of the secretary of defense disappear for 10 days and nobody knows it not his deputy, nobody else. And yet things continued to run because the White House treated a cabinet secretary as a clerk and not as someone who has been empowered to run the day-to-day operation of that vast department. It's an enormous job, obviously. Defense Secretary is an enormous bureaucracy. And of course, uh, the military is a huge machine. Typically, uh, defense secretaries, all the ones that I can remember anyway, either have had some, you know, quite extensive government experience, 
running other government departments. They've had some extensive high-level national security policy-making experience. We've seen some, you know, especially under President Biden, the military figures are doing job, and indeed under President Trump too, with General Mattis. I, I think the questions obviously about Pete Hexeth are, does he have the requisite experience to manage that kind of a job? Well, let me contrast that with General Austin. Well, the general's known me since I was a little fellow. My father was a senior officer in the 82nd Airborne Division when General Austin was a junior officer. So I've seen him for most of my life. And on paper, General Austin had incredible experience. He was a four-star general. He commanded the crown jewel of the Army's combat power, the 18th Airborne Corps, which is the 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions. And he was a combatant commander. So on paper, had enormous professional and bureaucratic experience. And yet we've seen the Pentagon uh, disintegrate in ways that are even surprising to people like me. Who, I, I was born in khaki diapers. I've been around this world my entire life, and I have been shocked at the level of chaos that has descended upon that institution, albeit with supposedly the professionals in charge. Hex has been, as you all have, and as President Trump has, has been very critical, and you, you've hinted at this already in your answers, very critical of, of what he described as a woke kind of uh, regime at the Pentagon, which is everything from you know, some of the senior appointments to the way in which the military has encouraged, you know, all kinds of, shall we say, innovations, whether it's women in the military, whether it's the promotion of affirmative action, whether it is things like and General Milley, Mark Milley, we know used to talk a lot about this, about combating supposedly a culture of racism and white supremacism and, you know, bringing in kind of DEI type concepts. It sounds though, from what, again, listening and reading a lot of what Pete Hicks has said, is that something that you and President Trump regard as a real problem and something you really want to roll back? Well, absolutely. Look, we have seen the assault on the notion of military meritocracy in the last four years. The military is the one profession other than professional sports where it doesn't matter what you look like or where you come from. If you perform, you're accepted. And what Biden has done is in the name of so-called equity. He has destroyed the military ethos. I'll give you an example. Uh, under Biden, you can pass the Army physical fitness test with 10 push-ups and two miles in 25 minutes. Now, the average 65-year-old American can walk a mile in 12 minutes. When confronted with this, the Secretary of the Army said that any stricter pass, passing standards are at war with underrepresented groups. Well, you're going to get overrepresented groups if you continue down that path, and those overrepresented groups will be dead on the battlefield. This is the same Department of the Army that said it does not want second and third generation recruits, people like me, because somehow that's at war with diversity, even though 79% of the soldiers in the Army of the United States come from army families. That's the kind of faculty lounge lunacy that has led to the lowest recruiting numbers since Craig Abrams and Richard Nixon came up with the all-volunteer force in 1973. And it does have consequences. You know, you look at basic training and you'll see that on the first day under Biden and Harris, these young people are being taught the proper use of pronouns, not the proper use of pronouns according to what you would learn at Cambridge and Oxford, but the proper use of pronouns that you would learn on some radical campus in the United States. The same thing applies to climate change. Uh, why a 17-year-old private who has passed the test to get into the 82nd Airborne Division has to care about spending hours and hours of his time away from learning his craft about climate change and the efficacy of UN climate programs. It's absolute lunacy. And that's the kind of thing that has to stop. We don't face an enemy that was as easy to explain as the sclerotic Soviet Union was. We face a three-headed enemy, three and a half if you include Kim, and they tell you over and over again they want to kill you. And as Golda Meir said, if somebody does that, you better believe them. And the path that Biden and Obama and Harris have gone down is dangerous, not only for the United States, but also for the West. How far could this rollback go? How far would you, would you like to see it go? And would the 
president likes to see going. I mean, I'm wondering, for example, things like there's been some, you know, some, you know, reasonable criticisms of women in combat roles. Women have been in combat roles, at least notionally, for some time now. Or the question of gays in the military, which was something that was, you know, resolved, we thought, say, 30 years ago. Well, initially, with don't ask, don't tell. Do you think these are something as well that maybe need to be reviewed? Well, I will tell you, Donald Trump put the first gay American in his cabinet. That has never been an issue for us, and it is not an issue that we would ever reopen. But what we will look at is fairness when it comes to training for combat. I'll give you an example. One size does not fit all. My father was a field artillery. Traditionally in the Army, the field artillery branch of the service has been the branch where you had the strongest soldiers in the profession. Why? Because they're toting around by themselves 200-pound artillery shells. The standard should be for the field artillery, you have to be able to survive in that environment where you're hauling around on your own hundreds of pounds of shells. Now, in terms of women in combat, you look at the physical fitness test and the dexterity test for pilots. Women outperform men on virtually every test. I've never heard Donald Trump or when I was responsible for readiness at the Pentagon say anything about the fact that women perform better. If they perform better, they're in. But we have to have realistic standards. We don't have them now, and that's going to get people killed. Now, one of the other things that's been talked about, and the Wall Street Journal has just reported on this, my colleagues in the journal in the last week or so, is that not just the sort of changes you're talking about, or maybe to help implement those changes, you're looking at the possibility of reviewing very, very senior officers, their roles with a possible view to removing some of them. This talk of these so-called warrior boards, you know, which would involve both senior officers and maybe some enlisted men too, which would review the performance of senior officers in the armed forces. Can you tell us what that's about? Well, yeah, let me just say, as somebody who's responsible for transition, and I've been working on executive orders for the last year. That's not an executive order I've seen. So uh, it was new to me when you all reported about these boards. But let me tell you what is real. If you look at the history of the United States Army and the British Army, the two most like forces on the planet in terms of tradition and what have you, if you look at the times when both of those forces were in dire straits, the U.S. Army prior to World War II, the British Army, say, in the, in the middle of the war in, in Asia during the Second World War, there was a house cleaning. There was a house cleaning of generals who were not physically fit, who were not agile intellectually, who could not lead. I mean, the most famous example is the mighty 14th Army of Great Britain as they were destroyed by the Japanese, and then a brilliant fellow named Bill Slim parachuted in, cleaned out all the dead wood, put younger officers who could fight in the front ranks, and destroyed the Japanese army in Asia. The same applied with General George Marshall when he was plucked from, I think, 132nd on the rank of seniority by Franklin Roosevelt, and was told to clean house. He got rid of old generals. He got rid of generals who did not buy into the president's program of rearmament and new training methods. So it's better that we do these things now than have to experience tragedy on the battlefield and do it after the fact. And to what extent would these decisions be made? Presidents have removed uh, senior officers in the past, probably most famously Douglas MacArthur was removed from his command. We saw President Obama removed Stanley McChrystal from his command for sort of insubordination, essentially, uh, some years ago. Are we talking here about President Trump intervening directly to remove some of these senior officers? No, the Secretary of Defense would have that authority. Remember, when you sign up, not only for a political job, but for a military job, particularly at that level. In fact, in the old days, let's just go back to Rumsfeld's days when I served under Rumsfeld. There were blank letters of resignation for all general officers that they had signed. And the only thing the secretary had to do was put a date stamp on it to make it effective. Those jobs are not for life. In fact, those jobs, once you hit three-star are not permanent in the sense that those are temporary ranks and you can only retire in higher ranks if Congress approves. So, no, I think any civilian leader in the Pentagon who has a deep knowledge of the different branches and where the services are going would be able to pick out uh, leaders who have not lived up to the standards that we should expect them to live up to. I'm not singling out anyone in the Navy, but I look at what I see in the Navy publications and officer after officer 
is relieved because of lack of confidence in the ability to command. It is scandalous that we're seeing four, five, six, seven examples of this every month. That's a crisis in command, and no one is being held accountable except some lieutenant commander or commander whereas the stars seem to, on the admiral's shoulders, seem to get off scot-free. Those are the kinds of things that we have to look at, and particularly when it comes to the changing national security environment. Are our general officers intellectually agile enough to meet the needs of this part of the 21st century? I mean, you know, obviously, where this is coming from, that there's concern, obviously, when you, especially when you talk about things like exactly what you've just said, which is the intellectual capabilities of some of these officers, that there's a fear, even among you know some Republicans and some supporters of Donald Trump and supporters of the new administration, that yeah. this represents potentially a kind of a step down a path towards a sort of politicization of the appointment of senior military and of the management of senior military officials. But how would you protect, at the same time, obviously, as maintaining civilian control over the military, how would you protect, how can we be sure that the military is protected from becoming essentially a where promotion? is decided along political right. lines and kind of, kind of almost a personal loyalty to the administration that uh, of the president. Well, let's look at the history of the United States military first. This was the first military in a Western nation that didn't swear an oath to a leader, such as King George III. Yeah. This was a military that, through its traditions, we didn't even know if senior officers voted. In fact, the two most famous generals of the 20th century. George Marshall and Dwight Eisenhower. One never voted, George Marshall. And Dwight Eisenhower voted for the first time when he ran for president. I didn't even know my own father voted. But those officers never expressed any political opinions. I think what we have to do is get back to the future on this and restore that sense of nonpartisan service. I mean, I'm even appalled when I see, and it doesn't matter if it's a Republican letter or a Democrat, where I see general officers signing on to blatant political letters during a political campaign. And the notion that senior leaders like Mark Milley and the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs can opine about blatantly political matters in front of the United States Congress or the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs sign a memo, which I have a copy of, that says he only wants 43% white pilots in the service. That is blatant politics. It is corrosive of the military ethos. And we have to get generals out of politics and back to what traditionally has been the strength of the armed forces of the United States. No political involvement, no attachment to a leader. And just one thing on the practical side to tell you that regardless of what I just said, we need to look at the size of the general officer corps in, in particular. We have more generals and admirals now with about 2.1 million under arms than we had in August of 1945 when Japan surrendered and there were 16 million Americans in uniform. It's out of kilter. We've got too much staff, too many generals, and not enough troops in the field. So that's the kind of thing we have to get back to, and I think that's something that President Trump recognized. You just mentioned there, you just particularly singled out that memo you mentioned from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that's General Charles Brown, yes. Air Force General Charles Brown. That does kind of, from what you're saying, now his term, I think, is strictly speaking, he's got another couple of years to run, but it sounds from what you're saying is that who, uh, and there's been some word to this effect that we've heard already, that maybe he won't be long for that role. Well, I don't know that, and I think actually the terms are only two years. Right. Look, I was serving with Bob Gates when Bob Gates took over from Donald Rumsfeld, and he dismissed uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Peter Pace, and refused to renew his term. So these are things that have been done by strong leaders when those leaders believe that the country and the military is not being served. I happen to have disagreed with Secretary Gates when it came to General Pace. But that was a decision that is fully within the purview of the Secretary of Defense. We're going to take a short break there. When we come back, I'll have more with Robert Wilkie, who is heading Donald Trump's transition team for the Pentagon, for the Department of Defense, and has got some significant plans for a big shakeup there. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. Welcome back. I'm talking with Robert Wilkie, 
who served as Secretary for Veterans Affairs in Donald Trump's first administration and is now been put in charge by the former president of drawing up plans for the team and for the plans that the new administration has for the Pentagon. So let's just talk a little bit broadly about the national security approach. And you've talked a lot about how important it is to you know get these reforms that you want to get done at the Pentagon. The president, as we, obviously we said, named Pete Hexeth as Secretary of Defense. He's named Marco Rubio for Secretary of State. He's named Mike Waltz as his national security advisor, Lee Stefanik, a UN ambassador. Rather than me doing it, how would you characterize the unifying, if you like, the unifying sense of mission and purpose that those people bring? Obviously, they'll all be looking to perform their tasks as President Trump's appointees, but how would you characterize that worldview? Some people have talked about it as kind of a, as a realist worldview. You know, some people talk about it as a kind of an assertive American exercise of American power. Look, you hit it. I think it's certainly realist. I think if Henry Kissinger were sitting next to me, he would be very happy with that lineup. I mean, look at what the, the issues that bring this group together. A recognition that the font of all misery in the Middle East of the Ayatollahs, a recognition that regardless of whether the war is in Ukraine or in the Middle East, or, or the Gulf of Aden as well as being in the Middle East, that there is one central node to all of this. It's China. And that weakening any of the outer fingers of the Chinese world weakens Beijing. I think having that kind of realistic national security team sends a warning. And people forget, and Donald Trump doesn't get the credit, but there's a reason that Vladimir Putin didn't invade Ukraine under Trump, because the one time his troops got too close to Americans in the Syrian desert, 300 Russians disappeared in a big red mist. The same applies for the Iranians with the death of Soleimani and the fact that when Trump left office, the Iranians had $5 billion in reserves left in their national bank. And they weren't able to fund Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. And the same applies for China and its malevolence toward Taiwan, its open malevolence. Uh, they were very cautious about engaging in naval exercises in the Straits off Taiwan. So I think having that approach backed by the renewed effects of American deterrent power will go a long way toward making the world a lot more peaceful. What's the realist view of the relationship with Russia? Is Russia an adversary? Oh, yes. Hmm. Now, that's Wilkie talking. Right. Absolutely. Vladimir Putin is the leader of, I think you could call it the world's largest gangster state. I don't believe those who, and you hear some voices about him being the new Hitler. I don't think he's a suicidally driven messianic leader. Uh, I think he's a typical thug whose prime directive is to um, stay alive. I don't think he's going to do anything that puts the very foundation of his regime at risk, but he has to be confronted. And by confronting him, by confronting the Iranians, it goes back to Beijing and it weakens that web. And it reminds us, I say this all the time, what Golda Meir said, that if someone tells you over and over again, he wants to kill you, believe it. And if we look at the world through those lenses and apply the kind of traditional American deterrent power, the chances of having armed and open conflict go down. But when we don't do those things, the world explodes and Americans are in danger. Your term as Secretary of Veterans Affairs in the first Trump administration, you ran into some issues. You were criticized by a VA Inspector General report of your handling of a sexual assault allegation. And, you know, there were calls for you to be fired and you weren't. Obviously, that was some years ago. Is that something that you think could possibly complicate it? I don't know what plans you had with this administration. No, let's look at that since you brought it up. You're referring to the first Inspector General report that had no referrals and no recommendations. An inspector general report that was built on unsworn statements by employees who had been fired for cause. Right. But it wasn't just me. It was the deep state. Because on the same day that a report was released about me, a report was released about the Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chow, using the most vicious racial stereotypes right out of the 20s and 30s about Chinese and family connections with organized crime. The same thing happened to Dr. Ben Carson. The same thing happened to David Bernhardt. And I would argue 
forcefully that these inspectors general, who are Democrat appointees, have been silent in seven languages as the Biden administration has engaged in malfeasance after malfeasance. So I certainly know that the Republicans in the United States Senate are willing to take a stand on the fact that that was a plain old-fashioned political hit job, just as the political hit job was launched against as I said, Elaine Chow, David Bernhardt, Dr. Ben Carson, some of the most distinguished political or public servants of our time. And that's the kind of thing that the American people have had enough of. Is the deep state at work? Oh, very much so. And it's interesting in my case, because even the Washington Post, which was the progenitor of a lot of this stuff, never saw fit to put those stories any place other than page A23. And it reminds me of something that Barry Goldwater said after his loss to Lyndon Johnson. He held one press conference and he looked at the media and he said, folks, until I read what you had to write about me, I never realized what an SOB I was. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing. Look, and it's also the kind of thing that keeps good people out of government. The weaponization of the law enforcement side of the federal government, Uh, the notion that an inspector general could use unsworn statements from individuals fired for cause to write an out-of-date report released on Christmas on an outgoing administration so there's no opportunity to respond. It doesn't take Clouseau or Colombo or Mrs. Marple to figure out that that was part and parcel of a massive hit job going on as the Trump administration was leaving town. It sounds, if I may say so, Robert Wilkie, like the Pentagon is, they should be fastening their seatbelts over there. They're in for a bumpy ride by the sound of things. Well, and some of them will deserve a bumpy ride, but it's all designed to protect not only the United States, but also the West in general, make the world safer. Robert Wilkie, thanks so much for joining Free Expression. Thank you. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much indeed again for joining us. We'll be back next week with another episode of Free Expression. In the meantime, enjoy your week and speak to you next time.